150 Democrat congressmen just voted against deporting illegal aliens convicted of DUIs. We are not talking about so-called victimless crimes here. As End Wokeness pointed out, in just one case, an illegal alien named Jose Menjivar with three DUI convictions killed a 46-year-old woman and her teenage son last month during his third DUI incident and was released without jail four days before the crash. We are talking about real crimes with real consequences in the real world. If the federal government enforced our nation's most basic laws, those Americans would still be alive. But they don't enforce those laws. They don't even hold the illegal aliens responsible for the other major crimes they commit while they are here. This is the perfect encapsulation of America last policymaking. It's almost a pathology. Our elected officials can't do enough for foreigners, even foreign criminals, even especially dangerous foreign criminals, and even more astounding, they can't seem to do much of anything for actual Americans. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. The congressional sex tape producer is not being prosecuted by the federal government. Stop the presses. Surprise of the year. We'll get to that story in just a moment. First, though, speaking of the government prioritizing illegal aliens over American citizens, a Boston man has gone viral after the city of Boston turned a park in a predominantly black neighborhood into housing for illegal aliens. And this local resident did not take very kindly to it. Sex don't equal to live here. And I've been here my whole because I can yell. Because I can yell. Because I can yell. And I'm angry. That's why. So why can't I get in the building? Why? Where's the mirror at? Y'all, these f- towns are f- yo. It's all about f- money. It's a f- money grab. Y'all give a f- about the mother f- that was born and f- raised here. Y'all raised the f- rent so f- high. Can't afford to live here. But y'all gonna bring some other mother f- here? That doesn't f- add up. It doesn't make no f- sense. None. None. I'm f- homeless. I work a full-time job, 40 hours, and can't pay to live here. How the f*** are y'all going to bring somebody else here? Don't make no f- sense. None. Totally agree. It don't make no effing sense. Absolutely. The guy has every right to be upset about that. This is someone who lives in America, he works, he pays his taxes, presumably, and he doesn't get to use his public services because those are all being diverted to illegal aliens from all Americans. It'd be one thing if if services and institutions were only being diverted from the awful, terrible, rich white people or something, then probably everyone would just move along. But it's not, it's from all Americans. The white people, the black people, the wealthy people, the poor people, it's all being diverted to illegal aliens when it is convenient by the city officials. Why is that? Why are foreigners being prioritized in front of everyone in the country? I think this ties into the decolonization rhetoric that we've been hearing in recent months and years. I I think this ties into the, the notion that we don't really have any right to be here. The United States, we're terribly privileged. Everyone across all demographics of every class, we're terribly privileged. This is stolen land. It's like all of those little email sign-offs from the really woke people at the universities. 
the, the email sign-offs that say, this is to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Hakahukahiki people, and we don't have any right to be here, and if, if we don't have any right to have national borders, and anyone who wants to come in and take our property, you absolutely should. We're the worst people in the world. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. And th- this is how the elites think. It's the elites who are putting those kinds of land acknowledgments and self-flagellations into their email signatures. And ordinary Americans are saying, hey, what is going on? This doesn't make any sense at all. And you can hear from the frustration in his voice. He says, I'm working a full-time job. <laughs> I'm doing everything. I, and I can't even go to the park. Now, speaking of working a full-time job, there is a young woman who has gone viral for uh, making a little TikTok video saying that she works a lot and she doesn't have enough time and money to really enjoy anything in her life outside of work. And conservatives are attacking her and uh, saying she's got to pull herself up by her bootstraps and stiff up her lip and all the rest of it. But that's not exactly my take on what she is saying. Why is it that I have to work 40 hours a week just so I can have a place to live? 40 hours a week makes me $2,000 a month and my rent is 1660 So I work 40 hours a week so I can have a two bedroom apartment and an extra $300 a month. Like, doesn't cover my phone, internet, food, you know? So not only do I not have any extra money, but just working makes me so exhausted that I don't have time either. Like I get off work at 5.30, come home and I'm just so tired. I'm so tired that like, Anything that I need to do outside of work, I then just push off to like the weekend and I'm like, I'm just too tired to do this after work. I'll wait until Saturday. So then I end up with so much to do on the weekend that ends up having to be split into two days. So I have to do stuff on both Saturday and Sunday. So then I don't get a day off. I don't get a day to relax. I don't get to decompress. So it is really like working seven days a week constantly and I I don't want to do that anymore right like I don't care how poor and miserable I would have to be but I literally can't have a place to live without this you know like I don't know what to do I'm not I'm not made for this I don't have the money time or energy to enjoy my life outside of work and I don't know what to do about it anymore you know I'm so tired I know the conservatives are making fun of her because they're saying oh listen here snowflake you know quit your belly aching 40 hours that's not so hard when I was a kid I used to walk uphill both ways in the snow and I'd work 400 hours a week And I never once grumbled about it, you snowflake. But that's not really my take on it. I totally sympathize with her. I empathize with her. You know, I remember when I was younger and uh, wasn't quite sure where my career is going and hadn't quite settled down into my personal life. And that was before we hit this, this period of massive inflation where people can't afford anything. When my wife goes to the grocery store, the eggs cost like $50 each at this point, you know, and they're college educated, organic, pasture raised, you know, properly pedigreed eggs. But still, all, all the groceries are like that. And the rents have gone through the roof. And what this woman is saying is, I, I have trouble affording my rent. I have trouble affording my groceries. I, I'm working 40 hours a week at a job that is not satisfying to me. And then I got to do my chores and errands on the weekends, but I don't have anyone with whom to split the bills and I don't have anyone to uh, take care of some of the chores. And I'd, I'm suffering from a crisis, not just of money and not just of work, but a crisis of meaning. That's what she's really saying. That's what that last line at the end there is, is I wasn't made for this. And that's true. What, what she's talking about is living in a, a world 
long after industrialization, long after the breakdown of civic society, a world long after the breakdown of community, where she feels isolated and she's living alone and she's carrying that burden herself and and the jobs have become so specialized and seemingly meaningless that she doesn't see any point in them at all, doesn't really see the fruits of her effort. And she gets to the end of it and she says, I don't even have leisure. And I'm not sure, frankly, I think what's implied by our present state of society is, I don't even know what I would do if I did have leisure time. And I, I don't feel that I was made for this. And I think she's totally right. We, we were not made for this. We're made to be part of a community. We're made to have a sense of our purpose. We're made to start families and have children. And we're made to uh, not just be automatons. But I don't know, even know what this woman's particular job is. But work increasingly over the last 150 years has turned human beings into cogs in a machine. And that's a problem. It's a problem, especially when the, the other aspects of life that give you meaning, religion, family, community, leisure activities, all go away. And so you're just left saying, what the hell am I even doing? I totally, totally sympathize. We have to restore some kind of balance. We have to restore balance to nature. So I would strongly recommend you check out Balance of Nature. Right now, go to balanceofnature.com, promo code Knowles. Balance of Nature, fruits and veggies are the most convenient way to get whole food ingredients every day. Balance of Nature uses an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and vegetables into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in Balance of Nature's fruit and veggie capsules are fruits and veggies. Right now, our listeners can get 35% off their first order, and they'll also get a free fiber and spice supplement. Balance of Nature's fiber and spice supplement is a revolutionary fiber drink with a unique blend of 12 spices and whole foods. Our producer, Mr. Davies over here, makes it a point to bring his Balance of Nature fruit and veggie capsules anytime we're on the road. He takes them every day because, you know, he's looking a little sickly, okay? I said, you got to make sure. I want to keep all of the Balance of Nature to myself, but in my great magnanimity, I said, Mr. Davies, you can have some, and he's looking much better for it, as far as I'm concerned. Go to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, for 35% off your first order as a preferred customer, plus get a free bottle of fiber and spice. That is balanceofnature.com, promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, for 35% off your first preferred order, plus a free bottle of fiber and spice. Turning from a woman, I think, justly complaining or understandably complaining to a woman who is not understandably complaining. We turn now to Sonny Hostin from The View, who insists that most Americans are racist. There are absolutely racist people in this country. It is not the vast majority of people in this country. And I feel like we don't know that. Well, what the FBI director said, white supremacy is the biggest threat to our country today. Well, that still doesn't mean that that's the vast majority of people. I just don't believe that in my day-to-day life that the people that you're encountering harbor racist viewpoints. I do think that this division that we're creating... If you look like me, you would believe differently. But you know what, Uh, Alyssa, the woman... woman, But just to to understand, are we saying, do we think the vast majority of Americans are racist? That's what I'm trying to... Help me understand. I think that there is a significant portion um, that are racist, and you can't dismiss my lived experience. And I, I never yeah, would when say, I, when I, don't, I would never dismiss When I say that. that there are a lot of racists in this country, oh, I, I just agree. experienced a- my son walking down the beach being called the N-word several times in Florida. There's, there is So don't, you can't say, I believe that the vast majority of people aren't racist. But again, we, I, we okay, don't know that. Okay, that's fair. There are 300 million people in this country. Right. I would never minimize your lived experience any yeah. more than I would yeah. mine but, as but, an but Arab see, woman. The majority of Americans are racist, even though there's no, um, and by racist, of course, Sonny Hostin does not mean uh, people attacking whites for the color of their skin by law or by culture. No, 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 it can't be that because you can't be racist against white people. No, no, it's got to be racism against black people and to a much lesser degree, every other race. And this is not borne out by any statistics. This is not borne out by any particular trends that anyone can point to. So of course, Sonny Hostin has to say, well, no, the proof is my personal anecdotes and you ought to believe me. Though Sonny Hostin is not really all that credible. As uh, uh, Nick Fondacaro points out, as this clip went viral, uh, she's been known to spread these sorts of hoaxes before. But we hear this kind of stuff all the time. No, no, no. 
look, whatever the statistics show, whatever you have experienced in your own personal life, just trust us. America is deeply, profoundly racist. There's no answer to it. I don't think that line works quite as well anymore, I do, but it, it is the consistent uh, cheat of left-wing scoundrels. <laughs> it is the, once you've run out of every other argument, once you've run out of every other um, tactic in politics, then you just cut to saying, well, my opponents are terrible racists, and that's that. And if you dare ask me for evidence, oh boy, then you're a racist too. How dare you question my lived experience with these pesky little things like facts and statistics and uh, history. That's always what it will get to. And you're going to hear a lot more of it in this election cycle because there's not very much for the Democrats to brag about. The economy's in shambles. We're on the brink of World War III. We don't have any borders effectively. You've got illegal aliens being let off the hook for additional crimes that they commit in this country. They've got nothing. And so the, tr truly the only argument they're going to have, they're going to try to pretend that the economy is better than it is. And then after that, they're going to say, well, you're a racist, <laughs> aren't you? Okay, that's, that's the evidence. It's proof positive that all the other issues for the Democrats are not going very well. Now, speaking of media figures, there is an undercover right-wing investigation par excellence by way of James O'Keefe, founder of Project Veritas, who now runs a, a new organization called OMG, the O'Keefe Media Group. Uh, James, <laughs> James went on a date, apparently, with a top cybersecurity official at the White House. This is a fella, so James pretended to be a gay guy, and he, he interviewed him over dinner and drinks to figure out if Joe Biden's going to be the nominee, if Kamala Harris is going to be the vice presidential nominee, and if Democrats in the White House are excited about that prospect. I work the White House. Up. So you're, you're pretty high up in the government. Yeah, I'm fairly high up. I'm good at keeping secrets. And so I manage two federal agencies, mm -hmm. the State Department and USAID. So when you say sec it's like security, like you're protecting... The networks of the federal agencies you're that you give all your information to. The mission to is to protect right. yes. information. And we, serve, we, we are like the president's voice when we go into meetings in terms of discussing and, and promoting the president's priorities. Is he, is he going to be the, the nominee? Yes. Uh, and she will be the vice president nominee. Yeah, I don't... There was a debate about removing her from the ticket, but sadly they didn't. She can't keep black staff. Huh? They quit on her in mass. But with him, I yeah, mean, I know. I know. he's got I know. dementia. Um, yeah, well, he's definitely slowing down. Well, they know that he has those issues. I think so. But they're not willing the to say it. Shows it. And, they're not and willing to say correct. it publicly. And same thing but with Kamala Harris. Is she's not popular, but you can't remove the first black lady to be vice president from the presidential ticket. Like, I what see. kind of message are you going to send to, like, all the African-American voters? How would you spin that? People would be like, what the f***? Like, like, she's a woman and she's multiracial. I think I think that they're really concerned about it. But they won't say it. Well, I guess if they say it publicly, Correct. Biden they can't is, say it publicly. is, uh, no, no. they can't say it publicly. No, no, they've got to they got to they say the it line. privately? You got him. He totally got this guy. The best part of the undercover investigation, of course, is that James O'Keefe's disguise is a pair of glasses and a somewhat effeminate posture. That, that was his whole disguise. Clark Kent, he just goes in there. So um, can you tell me about how much you all hate Biden and Kamala? Oh, sure, random guy I just met. You sure seem interested in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Why do you keep looking over at that cameraman over there? Anyway, yeah, we think Biden's a big dummy and he's totally demented. And Kamala, we hate her and we'd throw her overboard, except she's the first black female vice president. And so we can't throw her overboard. And if we tried to skip over her, or replace her with Gavin Newsom or somebody, it would never work because uh, we'd all be called racists just like Sonny Hostin did to everybody on The View. So anyway, yeah. Any other questions th that are extremely sensitive that could get me in trouble and, and make the White House look bad? Hey, I could be wearing a name badge that says James O'Keefe. That's real. Anyway, I don't know. Th this kind of a clip is one of the things that 
really starts to disprove conspiracy theories <laughs> because if this guy, if the top cybersecurity guy over in the Biden administration is this clumsy, as James points out, then I don't know, maybe there isn't a super competent evil cabal who's running anything, everything. And now the, the information that we get here is not, it's not sensitive in the sense that we all knew this, right? We all knew that Joe Biden is senile. We all knew that Kamala Harris is one of the worst politicians ever. She's, she's actually good at getting herself into positions of power, but she's really bad with the public. The public doesn't like her at all. She can barely string together a coherent sentence. We all know the Democrats want to replace not only Biden, but also Kamala Harris. And they can't do it because Kamala Harris is a black lady and they can't do it because Biden's going to cling to power. We know it. I guess the value in this kind of a sting is to hear it from the horse's mouth. The value in this kind of sting is to, it, it, living in an age where we are constantly being gaslit, to use the popular phrase, in the age where we are constantly being lied to and told not to believe our own lying eyes, that the White House thinks this stuff too. And then you get, no less important than the substance of what this undercover investigation reveals, is the theatrical flair of James O'Keefe revealing himself. So you work in cybersecurity for the White House, and my, my question is, what are you doing? on a meeting with James O'Keefe. What type of cybersecurity operation are you guys running over there? We're running a good cybersecurity operation. Obviously not. Obviously not. You're sitting here with me. Absolutely great stuff. This this is what this is what we have James O'Keefe for is this kind of stuff. Uh, but it won't it won't matter at all. Even though the the Democrats and the White House officials They all are seeing the same things we're seeing. They all know the same things that we know. It's not going to change. You know, there have been some people suggesting that there's going to be a uh, politician ex machina comes out of the wall in the final act of this election season, and it's going to be Newsom, or it's going to be uh, Michelle Obama. That's the really popular one now. Michelle Obama is going to come out of the woodwork at the convention, and she's gonna, they're going to kick out Biden, and they're going to kick out Kamala, and because Michelle is a black lady, she can replace Kamala, and she's going to be the top of the ticket, and she's going to win 57 states. And I just don't buy it. It's, it's just so clever. It's just so elaborate. It, it assumes so much. It assumes, for one, that Michelle Obama even wants to be president. I don't think she really does. I, I guess a lot of people would like to be president, but she's said many times, I don't want to do the kind of stuff that my husband had to go through. So she wouldn't run. Maybe she would accept it at the convention, but you still have to go through the, the gamut, even if you just accepted it there in, in the general election. And then every, t- every minute you're in office, I just don't buy it. And I don't think Biden's going to give it up. I think this is the race we've got. And some Republicans are unhappy that we've got uh, Donald Trump as the presumptive nominee, but it should be a consolation to those Republicans that many, many Democrats are just as unhappy that Joe Biden is at the top of the ticket. And it's very funny to see James O'Keefe, you know, slightly limp his wrist and put on a pair of glasses and speak in a, you know, with a little tiny bit of a lisp and all of a sudden nobody knows who he is. Now, speaking of weird sex stuff, There is a shocking new study out about transgenderism, which we'll get to in one second. First, though, we got to talk about renewal by Anderson. Right now, text Knowles to 200-300. If your house is feeling a little chilly right now, you might want to consider window replacements. I get it. For most homeowners, window replacement is not something they've ever done before. It might be a bit of a daunting task. Well, luckily, there is a company that will do the work for you. Renewal by Anderson is your one-stop shop for window design, manufacture, and installation. Windows play a crucial role in regulating indoor temperatures. If you notice a spike in your heating or cooling bills, it may be due to inefficient windows. Don't put it off any longer. Renewal by Anderson offers limited, fully transferable, and best in the nation warranty coverage. Right now, Renewal by Anderson is offering a free in-home consultation on quality, energy-efficient, affordable windows or patio doors with special financing options. Text Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to 200 300 for a free consultation. You will save 375 bucks off every window and 775 bucks off every door. These savings will not last long, so be sure to check it out. I had a carpenter write to me, unsolicited, say that when he works on homes with windows 
from Renewal by Anderson. It's the best DCs. I have a cousin who works for them. Says they are fabulous. Texting privacy policy and terms and conditions at textplan.us. Texting enrolls for recurring automated text marketing messages. Message and data rates may apply. Reply stop to opt out. Go to windowappointmentnow.com for full offer details. My favorite comment yesterday is from Cheryl Christensen who says, why is Zuckerberg apologizing to parents who provided these phones to their kids, but then didn't use parental controls or monitor their activity online? That's the parent's responsibility. I think because Zuckerberg realized that if he turned to a bunch of parents who've had children face tragedies on social media and said, hey, screw you, I'm not apologizing to you, that would have looked very bad. So he just did what he felt optically he had to do and politically he had to do. And maybe he felt it was the nice and sensitive thing to do. But I tend to agree. Parents should not be giving their kids smartphones. They're, and if if you do give your kid a smartphone for whatever reason, there should be a lot of controls on it, which probably one can get around anyway. But it, the, the fault for all these terrible outcomes for young people on social media does not lie primarily with Mark Zuckerberg. I'm happy to blame Zuckerberg for a lot of stuff. The guy may have thrown the 2020 election to uh, Donald Trump, or to Joe Biden, rather, by targeting Donald Trump. He did, he's done all sorts of terrible things. But I don't think we can really blame him for parents giving their kids smartphones. Okay, turning back to weird sex stuff. Now, speaking of personality disorders, the Harvard Divinity School, in its Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, that's the new version. That's the updated version of DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It's now Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging is hosting a gathering to breathe and heal. This, uh, I guess it, it took place yesterday. The gathering to breathe and heal uh, to uh, gather, to breathe and heal naturally, and to grieve, and to share the heaviness of what we're holding with others. It's not a space for debate. Harvard is not a space for debate. Rather, it is a container for holding emotions in community, knowing that the circle holds us all. Whether we agree or disagree, we're not going to debate. We're just going to go along with whatever the libs at the DEI office want. And we gather, we center anything that has happened that we need to prioritize. And so what is this all about? Well, this is to create a space for us to discuss and process the departure of our former president, Claudine Gay, the woman who was completely unqualified to hold her position as the president of Harvard, the woman who had 11 academic publications, half or more of which she plagiarized, (laughs) the woman who, just even that paltry number of publications, that's less than serious people would have in graduate school, forget about an entire academic career leading up to the top spot at Harvard, a woman who committed the most egregious academic crime, Uh, She lost her job. Oh, and also she seemed to justify genociding the Jews. She lost lost her job. And we need to grieve and we need to heal about that. Why are we grieving? Why are we healing? Is it just because Harvard Divinity School is completely insane? That's part of it. Is it just because the Harvard students and the apparatchiks and the administration are super lib and bizarre? Yeah, that's part of it. At a deeper level, though, this is about rewriting the story of Claudine Gay's firing. Yeah, look, Chris Rufo and the conservatives, they got that scalp. They got Harvard to fire the president. But they're going to rehab her. They grudgingly let this president go, and the rewriting, I, I could see it from day one, is going to be Harvard, brave Harvard president, pushed out by racists. Because they have no more arguments, so it's always got to be racism. That you saw this in Claudine Gay's resignation letter. She really did not take responsibility for all of the perfectly legitimate reasons she was fired. Never should have gotten the job in the first place. She insinuated, she stated that it was because of racism that she was pushed out of her job. That, that was scene one in the rehab story. Now we're at scene two, which is the Harvard administration, the students coming to get to heal for this awful thing that happened to the community, which is that that nasty, racist, conservative Christopher Rufo and his gang of the Ku Klux Klan pushed this poor beleaguered scholar out of her job because of their hatred. 
And I don't think they're going to put her back in the position because she was obviously so terrible at it and unqualified. But no one will remember the real reason. No, no one outside of conservatives paying attention will ultimately remember the real reason she was fired. Now, speaking of people getting fired, you remember, when was it, a month, month or so ago? We had a, an unfortunate video circulating around Washington, D.C. and really the whole internet. And it was a congressional staffer engaging in very, very depraved acts in a Senate r- hearing room. And uh, so the, the Capitol Police investigated, and they declined to press charges. They declined to press charges because they said uh, that they're not sure that, uh, that the video violated any laws. It surely broke the laws, uh, the rules of the Senate, and the staffer ended up leaving his job. It, I assumed he was fired, but now it's actually being reported that he resigned from his job for, for filming himself doing depraved sexual acts in the sacred temple of democracy that we were sold was, was so important that we can't have Midwestern grannies taking selfies in it, but uh, homosexual Democrat staffers in the Senate can film themselves doing a lot worse than holding Nancy Pelosi's lectern or whatever the January 6thers were doing that day. Well, they're not, they're not even going to press charges now. It's fine. Move along, move along. Nothing to see here. The, the, the way that they justify this is they say, look, he broke the rules and so he'll be fired, but what's the law that he broke? To which I say, if there is no law against bringing some dude into the Senate and having him do extremely depraved things to you on camera and then you know filming it and then uh, uploading it, and if there's no law against that, there should be a law against that. Our, the, the Congress needs to stop whatever it's doing. I know they're focused on the budget or the war in the Middle East or whatever. That can wait. Take 15 minutes. Pass a law that says that you can't turn the Senate hearing rooms into particularly extremely depraved gay brothels and porn sets. And then pass that done. We should have bi- we should have bipartisan consensus. We wouldn't. The Democrats would fight it tooth and nail, just like they're fighting deporting illegal aliens who have DUIs. But I think that would be that'd be a good law to pass. I'm for that government regulation. Now, something very very exciting. I told you that we were going to get new Mayflower cigars in. I was hoping by mid March or so, but I didn't know when they'd go online. They've sold out. It was the biggest cigar launch I think ever in history. We had what was estimated at an aggressive rate by the top guys in the industry to be a four month supply of Mayflower cigars, and we sold them in 24 hours. And then we got another little extra bit on a shipment that we had been pre selling for. It sold out immediately. They, and I think one last time, it sold out immediately, and we're not allowed to pre sell them too far in advance. Well, good news for you folks. And I'm telling you right now, Michael Knowles Show audience, the Creme de la Creme, they're available for pre-order. They're not going to ship just yet, but they're available now for pre-order. This is a very sizable batch, and I'm telling you, it is going to sell out, and it's going to sell out very, very fast. So if you want to get your delicious Mayflower cigars you missed the first time, or you got some, but you didn't get enough, and you only got a sampler pack or whatever, order them now. Order as many as you are going to want for the foreseeable future, because we can't rush this process. This has already taken us months to get this supply. It's going to once this sells out, it's going to take us months afterward. 21 years old or older to order. Some exclusions may apply. Also, it's Groundhog Day, and the Groundhog might be surprised by his shadow, but you don't have to be surprised by yours. Control your shadow this Groundhog Day with Jeremy's Razors. This Groundhog Day, Jeremy's Razors is offering 15% off the Founder's Kit, which can be your choice between the Precision 5 or Smooth 6 Razors. The Founder's Kit is a one-stop shop for your shaving needs. Razors, shave cream, and post-shave balm, and a nice travel bag. So make sure you go to jeremysrazors.com to get your Founders Kit for 15% off today. In a day and age where we can trust a groundhog more than we can trust scientists to predict the climate, it's nice to have trust in Jeremy's razors to deliver a great shave every time. Finally, finally, we've arrived at my favorite time of the show. I was up very late last night. I was in a podcast studio all day yesterday. I did, I think, nine or 10 hours of shows for the Whatever podcast available now on my YouTube channel. There's one little debate with some a handful of people on feminism, and then there was the big Whatever dating show, which I was on last year, and I, I've now made my annual appearance. You can get that on YouTube. And then I woke up this morning, 
And what got me out of bed after very little sleep? I'll tell you what. The mailbag. Our mailbag is sponsored by Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, for an additional 50% off your first month. Take it away. Hey, Michael. Big fan of the show. Quick question for you. What is the most recent issue you've changed your stance on, and what made you change your mind? Great question. I would say the biggest thing I've changed my mind on recently is Xi Jinping, of all things. I'm not saying I'm pro Xi Jinping or anything now, but I I used to believe that the Chinese Communist Party was just, you know, just communist. There's commies, nothing really different between Xi Jinping and some of his predecessors in that role. And I don't think that's true, actually. I think that Xi Jinping is not even close to a doctrinaire communist, and that makes him a much more uh, worthy and formidable adversary. Uh, And the thing that changed my mind on it was reading some of his speeches, because Chairman Xi uh, speaks in, in some ways like a conservative. Certainly on some cultural issues, I don't think there's any risk of wokeness coming to China. But, but even on the economy, he says, yeah, we need liberalized markets in certain places, but we don't, we don't want the liberalization of the markets to run away such that the, the tail wags the dog or anything like that. But yes, we do need some free markets. They can be a wonderful thing. And uh, even the way he describes the ideology, I think he says it's socialism with Chinese characteristics or something like that. Uh, so it's, not, it's just not, not quite as simple and ideological as you would, you would expect from, you know, reading in a, an elementary textbook about the Chinese Communist Party. And we should, we should get wise to that because China is challenging the United States, which is the global hegemon, for bipolarity. And if, if all we continue to do, especially on the right, is fight against a caricature of, you know, the damn reds over there in China, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to seriously confront the, the, the real adversary. Next question. Hi, Michael. My name is Connor Caldwell, and me and my wife are very avid pasta enjoyers. We use pasta in general as a relatively simple and easy recipe for the week, so we are not stressing out so much about dinner. And I'm curious, uh, you being Italian, what is your favorite pasta for one, and then what is your favorite pasta recipe? Because those can obviously be very different. Um, But I'm curious as to what your favorite pasta slash pasta recipe is and, you know, how you prepare it, what do you pair it with, whether that's a wine or some other fun liquid you like to enjoy. Um, But yeah, anyway, I appreciate your answer and looking forward to hearing back from you. Thank you. My favorite pasta, my favorite dish, my, my, what I would ask for if I were on death row and I had my final meal would be Sweet Little Alisa's lasagna, which which gets us to a distinction in pasta between fresh pasta and dry pasta. Fresh pasta, you roll out, and there's a lot of egg in it. Dry pasta is what you buy in the cardboard box. So you roll out the fresh pasta for the lasagna, and then you boil it for a minute or two, and you lay it down in the pot, and then you get the nice, delicious uh, uh, bolognese sauce, which uh, Elisa's version is very, very good, and it has beef and pork in it. And then you get a little bechamel, and then you put a little bit of the cheese, the Parmesan cheese, and then you layer it again, and you rinse and repeat until you get a nice, juicy, delicious lasagna. Now, that's a little bit labor-intensive. If uh, I want fresh pasta, but I don't want to roll it out, I've been reliably informed by sweet little Elisa just some days ago that the fresh pasta from Costco kind of slaps, in her words. And uh, if I don't even want to deal with that, then I'd probably make the quickest kind of pasta that I, I would go for on any given day would be spaghetti alla carbonara, which is very simple. It's like an Italian bacon, egg, and cheese where you uh, fry up a little pancetta in a pan, you know, aglio olio, a little pancetta, and then you make your pasta. And then you make a sauce that's out of eggs with some extra yolk in there and a lot of Parmesan cheese and a lot of pepper. People underdo the pepper. You got to put a lot of pepper in there, and then you kind of mix in the egg. You're not frying the egg. You just mix it in with the pasta over very, very low heat, and you kind of spin it all around, and then you make a delicious pasta dish. That was probably a more thorough answer than anyone was anticipating. Next one. Hello, Mr. Knowles. My name is Noah, and I am a PhD student at the University of Connecticut studying neuroscience. I'm a Catholic and have always believed that God chose to limit his power by giving us free will. However, I haven't been great at articulating this truth. 
How might I articulate this to people who do not believe that we have free will? I ask because whenever someone wants me to explain, I get speechless. Anyway, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. My favorite way of convincing people that free will exists is by just punching them in the face. I just, you know, they say like, oh, free will doesn't exist. I just start punching them in the face, you know. And then they'll say, hey, stop punching me in the face. I say, I can't. I can't. St- I'm not even punching you. I have no will. This was just all predetermined. Sorry. Ha ha. You know, they give them a swirly or something. No, I don't recommend that. I don't recommend any violence, but I would recommend maybe describing to them that possible scenario. Because if there's no free will, then there's no moral culpability at all. And usually when people deny free will, they're doing so because they recognize rightly that God is sovereign over the universe, and they're trying to make sense of how that can be the case, that God is totally sovereign, but also man has free will. And how do do, do will and grace interact? And uh, one way to think about it simply is that God is outside of time and space. So, you know, we, we view events happening within time. But for God, it's all the same. He's seeing it all at, at uh, all the time. So the two don't really contradict each other. And uh, while God's grace is, um, comes from him, obviously, we uh, must have the ability to turn away from God's grace and to cooperate with God's grace. And so it's not to say that uh, man is so totally free that we can do whatever we want, including to save ourselves. That's not it at all, but we do have at least the modicum of freedom to cooperate or reject God's grace, um, without, without which there would be no, no moral culpability whatsoever. And you can keep punching your friend. Next one. Hello there, Puff Daddy. Uh, John here from Alaska with a philosophy question uh, brought to your mind by your coverage of the show about hell on Amazon last week. Um, so we know angels are great and powerful and we, the spiritual world is good. But we also know that the material world is good because everything that God has created is good. So how do you affirm that angels are greater than men without positing that the material world is evil? And in other news, uh, in light of recent polling data and bearing in mind that he needs to shore up the suburban white women vote, uh, do you think Donald Trump might tap Taylor Swift to be his VP? Uh, What do you think? Uh, Thank you. Bye-bye. Sign me up. Trump Swift 2024 would be unstoppable. I'm skeptical it would happen, but it would be unstoppable. As for the uh, first question, uh, as to the first part of your question, uh, you're you're right that God makes the spiritual world good and God makes the physical world good as well. Some of the Gnostic heresies have denied the goodness of the physical world perhaps most famously, the Cathar heresy, the Albigensian heresy, uh, was one that cropped up that the church had to put down because it would have destroyed all of civilization. And it said that the material world is very, very bad. And so it encouraged, uh, well, basically the end of our material existence. But no, the material world is good too. You know, sin and death pervade the world as a consequence of the fall of man. And so that leads to corruption all over the place. But uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, we just give up on it entirely. I, the, I think the mistake you make there is you say, uh, we know that the angels are greater than humans, but they're not actually. They are in, I guess, in the, the order of creation. But uh, w- what's so amazing is that our Lord himself takes on flesh and, and becomes man. So he, in his incarnation, elevates mankind, which is made lower, is made corporeal, but elevates the flesh up to to become as sons of God. Uh, And this would arouse the enmity of a certain uh, once beautiful angel now uh, rotting in a pit of fire forever. And uh, and it ennobles mankind, you know. Um, So yes, it's true the angels are pure spirit, and we are not pure spirit. We're spirit and flesh together. Um, But we, we, have, we have been uh, raised up with our Lord who, who lowers himself to take on flesh and dwell among us. Okay, uh, so let's get to some written mail back before we go from Colby. Dear Mr. Knowles, do you believe therapy is worthless and doesn't benefit society outside of enabling people? I'm in therapy right now and trying to use it to get over some issues I've been tamping down. I don't like therapy 
but I need to talk to someone because suffering in silence isn't helping me out. If anything, I'm seeing it as limiting my growth as a person, and I'm not achieving my full potential with whatever time I've left on earth. So is suffering in silence your only view when it comes to therapy, psychology, or anything else of that nature? I'd love to hear your stance on this and hope it'll help me with how I should deal with therapy and my own mental health going forward. Oh no, I hope I haven't given that impression. I think when I say suffer in silence, uh, well, the other day I was using it in reference to Elmo <laughs> because Elmo tweeted out, said, how is everybody doing? Okay, I got to figure out my Elmo impression. And everyone just started whining and complaining. And I said, hey, stop whining and complaining, you know, like keep it to yourself and keep a stiff upper lip. Uh, and I do think that therapy is overprescribed, even talk therapy, but especially psychiatric uh, counseling where the, basically the shrinks are just drug dealers and people go to their shrink for 30 years and they never get any better. They usually get worse and then maybe they just get some drugs on top of that. That's, that's really bad and I'm, I oppose it. Furthermore, I oppose uh, pathologizing ordinary aspects of the human condition, um, which we tend to do these days. But that doesn't mean that all therapy is bad. I, I think that some therapy can be very, very good. I know some conservatives write it off, but I don't just totally write it off. In fact, Drew Clavin once said that he was cured by therapy, and he said he might be the only person ever in history that's been cured by therapy, but it can happen. So I, I don't discourage you at all from going to a therapist. I would just make sure, one, that your therapist is on the same page with you about fundamental things. You know, if your therapist is a big lib atheist and disagrees on basic questions about what man is, uh, what man's role is in the world, what happiness and flourishing are, then the therapy is probably not going to be very helpful. Uh, but if the shrink is on the right page and, and there is a path to getting better and to not needing the shrink anymore, then I think that can be very helpful. Okay, that's our show. Now, there will be a member block. Even though I will be flying back to Tennessee shortly after this, you will get a sneak peek of me getting a sneak peek of an amazing rap video. The greatest rap video that has come out in the last month, without question, by a member of the Creme de la Creme. And it's a rap video about Mayflower cigars, which are back in stock, and you can pre-order right now and should pre-order if you ever want to get them in the next few months, 21 years old or older, to purchase. Some exclusions apply. Check it out over there, and I will see you back in the studio chair next week.